And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcasting and interviewing John Winnick. Thank you so much for coming over to my house today. Oh, thank you for the invite. He is a general dentist who has been in practice for four years in Columbus, Ohio. He graduated in 2014 from The Ohio State University. He is an owner of a Comfort Dental franchise, which are located across the country in many states, including Colorado, Ohio, Washington, Kansas, Arizona, and Texas. He, along with his partners, have grown their dental office from $2.3 million in collections in 2013 to almost $5 million in collections. John and his partners own the largest Comfort Dental in the country and rank second in collections out of 124 offices nationwide. He has been happily married to his wife, Lauren, for four years. They are about to celebrate the first birthday of their son, Alexander? Alexander? Alexander, yeah. Oh, Alexander with a K. It's just the Ukrainian uh, oh. version of, of that name. I have never seen Alexander with a K. That is so cool. It was my grandfather's name. So we just, we kind of just kept the tradition going. Nice. Uh, my uh, grandfather was Howard Tapferan. And then when he had my dad, he was no longer in love with President Taft and couldn't stand him. So he named my dad Howard Eugene Fran. So I'm Howard Eugene Fran the second. So if President Taft would have been a little better president, I'd be the third. But uh, so what, how many Alexanders are there? Uh, just, just my grandfather, as far as I know. But yeah. I, I didn't realize you were a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, John would like to discuss some tips for dental students just learning how to treat patients, new dentists trying to figure out career and life strategies, and any dentist trying to increase their production, make a better living, and enjoy their profession and career a little more. John believes that a little hard work can go a long way in growing your practice and success. So um, I thought it was when we met in um, a townie meeting uh, a few weeks ago that um, that people consider comfort like corporate dental. Right, so that was one of the main things I wanted to address right off the bat. That way uh, a lot of people don't just tune off the podcast and be like, oh, another corporate dentist is on here. Uh, it, it's, so it's a, it's a franchise uh, dental office, so it's just like you know with the Sonic franchise that your, your dad used to own. Um, you know, there's, there's franchisors that uh, come up with the business model, and what we do is they just kind of open up offices, put them up for sale, so what I did this uh, office that I'm at in Whitehall, Ohio, was actually the first, um, one of the first comfort dentals in Ohio. And so I bought out, there was four doctors there when I bought one of them out in 2014 when I graduated. In Columbus, Ohio. In Columbus, yeah. Okay. So Whitehall is just like a little suburb, just like okay. Ahwatukee is a suburb of Phoenix. Um, and we... So I, I, he, was, he had his practice for sale. He was going to a different Comfort Dental location up in Marion, which is another suburb. Um, and so I just I bought his practice. I bought his patients, his collections. And so I had uh, income instantly, which was nice, graduating, you know, 300000 in debt. And uh, it, it's, it's, so bought, it's, it's, so it's you, a normal dental office. I'm a normal dentist. I'm not a corporate dentist. There's no quotas to meet. There, you know, I don't have, like, the franchisors, like, you know, breathing down my neck, you know, saying like, why aren't you doing more stuff? You know, we hire, we fire, we, we are responsible for ordering our supplies. We, we do everything like a general dentist does. It's, it's just under a, a, a franchise name and then there's a business model that we follow to be successful and, and we pay them a small royalty to, to be in business. So you, when you bought the office, you were the only dentist in? No, no, no there, there's four dentists all together. So I just, I basically just swapped one of them out. So. Oh, okay. So there were four dentists and you bought one one out. Correct. And he, he, he was, he he was working in two practices, two comfort dentals, and he was just working like 60 hours a week and he just couldn't do it anymore. He wanted to just do normal dental hours, normal full-time job. So how old was he when he sold? He is just a few years older than me. He's like 34, 35 okay. right now. Yeah. And I'm you'll, you'll, never, you'll never meet a 55-year-old dentist working 60 hours a week. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I don't think be I very, can even, So, so I explain even to someone... Um, because we got listeners around the world, but how would you describe the biz the, the franchise, the business model? So um, we are open uh, 66 hours a week. We are open Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 7.30, and then Saturday, 7.30 to 1.30. M Monday to Friday what? 7.30 to 7.30, and then uh, Saturdays, 7.30 to 1.30. 7.30, 1.30. So... And that's how many hours? 68? 66 altogether. 66. 66 hours. So there's uh, all... 
when we had four dentists, we've recently expanded, but um, when there was four dentists, we always had two on a shift. And so we would rotate what we did. So every single week is different. So um, like this past week, I worked a 12 on Monday. I worked a six on Tuesday in the PM. I worked a 12 on Wednesday. I was off on Thursday. And then I worked a PM on Friday. And that was my, my full time, my 36 hours. So every partner works 36 hours? Uh, well, with the schedule being, being like it is, um, you work 36 hours one week and then 30 hours the next week and then 36 hours and 30. So you average about 33 hours. Um, we've, we've expanded and we've had to change a couple things as far as we don't, we don't follow this to a T anymore um, because we have three doctors on it at all times now since we've opened up more dental chairs. Um, so now sometimes we have like this eight hour shift that we do now from 10 to six. And so there are occasionally weeks that we work a tiny bit more than like our normal 36 or 30, but we average, I would say I average about 35, 36 hours a week, um, actually like doing dentistry and business. And then I, I come in about a half hour early to, to take care of like charts or open up the office. And then I stay about half hour, 45 minutes afterwards. So, you know, kind of keeping that mentality, you know, like first one in, last one to leave, kind of that hardworking blue collar mentality that uh, I want to keep in, in my, as I practice general dentistry. And who instilled that um, blue collar mentality into you? My dad did. My, uh, my family is very blue collar. You know, uh, I'm the first doctor at all in my family. And uh, my dad's just, was a super hard worker. That's one of the biggest things I remember about him. You know, he, he used to work like, if he worked 60 hours, that was like a, that was an easy week for him. And uh, I remember times he would work like 110 hours in a week. He would, he would just work like round the clock and then they would c pay him to sleep for eight hours and then he'd go back and work another, you know, 16 hours and then they'd pay him to sleep eight hours, work 16. So he, he was just a super hard worker and he wanted me to go into his business. He, um worked for CEI, which is like a illuminating company, like First Energy, I don't know what you guys have out here as far as power supply companies. But um, he would, if the power went out, he'd climb up the, the lines, fix the you know, transformers, repair any power lines. Um, so real, real hard, you know, working in the cold Cleveland winters uh, year round, and you know, it got hot in the summer, believe it or not, in Cleveland. And uh, bitter cold, windy, Cleveland Winters, just really hard worker. He wanted me to go into it, and I was like, you know, I, I'm, I'm a hard worker, but I'm not that hard of a worker. You know, I'm still a millennial and <laughs> everything, but... And yeah. was he first generation <laughs> Ukrainian? Or uh, yes, so my, well, my grandma was pregnant with him when she came over to America. So I, like, just missed out on being first generation American. So he was born in North Carolina as soon as she got off the boat. And then they moved up to, to Cleveland, Ohio. And you like you like Columbus better than Cleveland? I do. It's certain certain things about it. You know, I, I like uh, the Ohio born State and raised in University. Cleveland, right? Yes, I was born and raised in Cleveland. I love the Cavs, love the Indians, love the Browns. Big Cleveland sports fan. Just uh, love the people. Um, but Columbus is just a really nice uh, melting pot. There's, I mean, it, it's. I think, believe it or not, it's like one of it's like the fourteenth biggest city in the country. I think wow. it's huge. It's really expanding. Um, there's so much to do there. Um, the temperature is a little bit better. It's about ten degrees warmer because because of the lake up in Cleveland. So it is a little bit nicer weather. And uh, I actually went. I actually came to Columbus to go to dental school. And um, you know, we just I uh, met my wife uh, the first week of dental school. And uh, we just stayed there ever since. What, did you meet her in dental school? Is she a dentist too? No, my wife is a preschool teacher um, or early childhood education teacher. But what happened was, long story short, I got turned down my first year apl uh, applying to dental school. I applied to like 20 different schools, didn't even get an interview from them. So I took a year off, uh, worked at a bank as a teller, um, and then I was reapplying. I took the DAT a few times. Long story short, I got in my second year to Ohio State, I met uh, a girl in my class, her name's Sahar. She was uh, real nice. We started a, a study group together. First week of dental school, she had a party and she's 
So she invited some of her friends from high school in college, and she said, hey, I'm, I'm having a party. So she was best friends with my wife in high school. They ran cross country together. She's like, come up here, I'm, meet some of my dental friends. I'm, I'm having a party. We met at this party, and we were dating ever since and together ever since. So it, it, it's kind of like a blessing in disguise that if I didn't get rejected from dental school that first year, I would have never met my wife. Well, you know, that's really kind of an arranged marriage. It, it's a little bit, yeah. Because yeah. when you when <clears throat> because I think a lot of Western people don't understand what, how arranged marriages work. What it is is it's not that your dad and mom say you got to marry this one, but they do provide all the interviews. You know, so all all your leads are screened. You know what I mean? So instead of just a random love marriage where you guys meet someone at a bar. Oh right, right. You know, right. you go to India and you know that. You know, your sister would have had a party, invited her friends, you know, so um, your wife's best friend. It, it was technically arranged, yeah. You yeah, could it say was, that uh, way. yeah, it was a qualified she was, lead. Uh, she was showing pictures of me on Facebook before the party, and I guess she was like, oh, that guy's mine, so. <laughs> that is awesome. So, um, but what would you, um, what would you describe the Comfort Dental franchise? How, how would you, I mean, not, uh, the, the, the system. You know, Invented by Rick Kirshner. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, so he talks about uh, this principle called lean and mean. And that's his, and I, I'm, I know that you're more than familiar with it, but, and that's a whole other podcast for you. To, I, I told him I'll, 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 uh, I'll heckle him for you a little bit during this uh, trip here. Please, I hope, I said, because he, <laughs> um, he had mean and lean group, mean and lean hygiene, and the mean yes. and lean system. So uh, he just talks about how, how to run your practice as efficient as possible, to, to lower your overhead. The, the key, in, to make a long story short and to summarize it in as few words as possible, um, is, is maintaining low overhead and just managing your office so efficiently that you can, it is possible to, to have a 50% or less overhead and you can just be very successful doing it that way. You can keep your collections the same way they are uh, and, and just bring, have more gross profit because uh, you, your overhead goes from 70% in a typical dental office. Is that correct? I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with private the, the practice AD, offices. Yeah, the ADA just, says the average is 65%. 65. So, so 65%. You, you, can, you can drop that to about... You know, 55, 50 percent, and then that that just increases your your revenue by 10 or 15 percent. And it's amazing because you do it. You you take Medicaid, correct? Or, you, so, what what percent of the dentists? In, uh, how many dentists are in Ohio, and how many do you think take Medicaid? Oh, or geez. What percent? I I would say it's it's very minimum. I I don't know the off bat, but. I know we are one of the very few dentists in the Columbus area that um, that accept Medicaid. Yeah, I, I would thought, I would say maybe if you count like the people that do it like one day a week, maybe like thirty percent, forty percent at the most, and those are so mo know. most people would think that with the low Medicaid fees, your overhead would be a hundred percent. You know that you don't. Mo most people think if your if your overhead's a dollar, you need to charge two dollars to get to fifty percent overhead. But if your overhead's a dollar and you're taking low fees, so how do you, um, is Medicaid a big part of your practice? Yeah, it's about 65 to 70% of our practice. So that, that's kind of where our office is different and, and where we do differ from a normal private practice is uh, we, do, we do see a lot of patients. We, uh, we do work a little bit harder, I would say. That, you know, I, I don't take breaks, I don't take a lunch, and that, that's by choice. I, I'd rather work and be more productive than, than shut the office down for an hour while I, while I eat my lunch or, or go run some errands. You know, I, I've always kind of had that mentality throughout school where, uh, you know, if I had like a, if class got out like 10 minutes early, I would do a, a sheet of homework for another class during that 10 minutes instead of going to like, you know, the cafeteria or standing by my locker shooting the bull, you know, with some friends that I could do that after school with. I'd rather, you know, have that time after school to hang out with friends than do homework. So I would, I would like, you know, if I had 10 minutes here, I'd get some of my homework done there. 15 minutes here, I'd get some of my homework done there. And that, that's what I do in my practice. I, we all work very hard. We see a ton of patients and uh, we have a great, great staff and, and team that, are top-notch that help us take as 
good of quality of these patients as, as a, I could argue some people take care of their, their patients in their private practice. You know, I, I really strive to treat Medicaid patients the same way I treat my mom, my wife. Uh, I, I really, you know, uh, the other day I was uh, doing a filling on my mom and I, about halfway through the procedure, I, I just stopped and I think to myself, I go, I, I'm, I'm really treating my mom the same way I treat my patients. I'm, I'm doing the same exact thing. And so it, we, we have specific, you know, things in, in line that we just, the business model is just more of like a hard working mentality. And, uh, so we we just try to pride ourselves on that, and a lot like a little bit more hard work can can go a long way in reducing your overhead, and and it works well for us. We had about a forty four percent overhead average last last year. Holy moly, forty percent! So accepting Medicaid is really a unique selling proposition. I mean, are there many dentists around you in Columbus taking Medicaid? Um, a, f- a few, but um. I don't think I don't think as as well as we do it. I mean, I, I'm I don't want to like sound like arrogant or anything like that, but we really strive to to make it the best experience possible. You know, like a lot of people have the stereotype, you know, Medicaid dentists like you know the lights are flickering and dungeon and there's you know all kinds of you know dirty instruments or uh, things aren't sterilized or things are, you know, we're buying our composite from, from Walmart Dental Center down the street. Um, you know, we, we use all the top of the line products. You know, we, we use the Wave 1 Gold system for our, for our endos. We're using, you know, Henry Schein uh, is who we contract with uh, through Comfort Dental. So we use all Henry Schein products, what they sell, what, what they sell through third-party distributors. So we're not using like junky crappy products where we tr- we really try to bring that level of customer service to our to our Medicaid patients. What percent of the dentists in Columbus do you think do not take Medicaid? What would you guess? Well, it, you know, like I said it uh, earlier, if it's, I, I think it's, a, I, I would ballpark it that like people that take it like one day a week even, if you include those, it's probably like 30 to 40% maybe take it. But then, so it would probably be like 60 to 70% that don't. And it, and it may be more. I, I could be way off on those numbers. But do you, do you hear much um, patients saying that it's hard to get into a dental office or their Medicaid? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, especially with kids. Oh, kids, like, there, there's like two places you can go for kids. And we actually just had one of... Uh, one of the dental offices that we, we used to refer to, they just sent us a letter saying that they're no longer taking Medicaid. And so now we're down to like Nationwide Children's Hospital, which takes about eight months to get into, and uh, a pediatric dentist down the street that we send to, and they take about a month or two to get into as well. So um, we actually, when we expanded our office and we uh, opened up more dental chairs, I specifically had a, our contractor put in two completely enclosed like privacy rooms and so we can work on more kids and that way you know if if they do like you know cry or or yell or or things like that you know or just they're just not able to behave you know we can kind of keep them separate from the other patients to just you know make sure they know that we're not trying to torture them and things like that so we do um we do those for uh, we have completely enclosed rooms for patients that uh, are super nervous about getting their teeth pulled. So you know, I'll, I'll tell them you know if they're super anxious, and I'll tell them like, oh, we have our we'll put you in our surgery suite. We'll we'll take really good care of you. We have laughing gas as an option. We also we also have a doctor that comes in and does IV sedation once a month uh, to take teeth out and everything. So we we really try to. Um, is make that it as big, convenient as is possible. Is that a big draw, having an anesthesiologist come in? It is. Uh, it, well, is he an MD or a rich? No, he's a DDS. He's just a general oh, dentist. Oh, he's a dentist. Yeah, he's just a general dentist that just got really good at sedation, really good at uh, is he board taking certified? out teeth. Anesthesiologist? I, I know that he has his sedation credentialing. I don't right. I don't know what all that Cause entails. Cause but. I, don't, I, I, for, I don't think there's many schools. I think there's only like seven that does. I know Oregon has a... He didn't do it no. through school. I don't. I okay. don't believe. I, I. I believe he just. He did it. Uh, on so he his comes own in. What? How often does he come in? He comes in once a month, and uh, he usually takes out super impacted wisdom teeth. Oh, he does anesthesia and the surgery. Correct. So yeah. So he he does both, and then um, 
he has a he has an associate with him as well, and then he has um, four dental assistants that are trained to monitor the sedation. Um, so he he either does like super impacted wisdom teeth that we can't get out ourselves, or um, patients that are just like absolutely have to be put to sleep. We we try to not sedate people as much as possible, but you know if we can't get a tooth out on you awake. You you really need to be asleep. Do you um? Does he place implants too? He does. He re- he places implants. He uh, repairs implants that are failing. Um, he does all kinds of grafting. It's incredible how much he does. And he's only like five years older than me too. He's like only like 34, 35 years old too. So he's he's got a really good head on his shoulders. He's actually taught me a lot about um. Does he have his own office or does he only travel? He does. He he has his own office, but he doesn't really use it too much. He he does just a lot of like. Uh, independent contracting around where he just kind of travels to different offices and he uh, he he mainly I would say about 80 85 percent of his work is traveling to different offices doing IV sedation. Yeah and you're starting to see that business model more I mean when these kids um, you know now that dental school is 70 to 100 thousand dollars a year they're routinely coming out 400 thousand debt and then they go to endo school or perio school three more years and it's like okay so you're graduating Six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars of debt, and your yeah. first idea is to go buy a land, a building, a practice, all that stuff. And I'm starting to see that more where they'll, you know, or an area will be really saturated. So they'll just go talk to the five, ten biggest practices, and uh, and I think that's a well, that was one of my biggest concerns about graduating too, because I was I graduated with about three hundred thousand in student loans, and uh, I I was I think I was one of the I think maybe one or two other people in my class of 105 bought into a practice right away. Um, I, I I bought my practice for 450,000. How much um, what percent is 105 in your class? Yes. And how many of them walked out and, and bought a practice? Maybe two or three. Yeah. I And so you were 300 in debt and bought a practice for 450. Mm-hmm. Now did you have um, was it hard to get financed? No, they they uh, they help you finance the Comfort Dental helps you f- uh, finance it. Yeah. Uh, so it, it wasn't it wasn't hard. Yeah. They 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 do it all the time for. for I graduated and, May 11 and had my office open September 21st. I mean, I mean, what is that? Four months? May, June, July, August, September. I mean, you know, four months. And uh, I I don't know why. Stressful four months. I I just don't know why people um. I, I don't know why they wait so long. Well, I graduated May 2nd, 2014, and I bought my practice May 9th, 2014, and I started working. My license was uh, active uh, at like 10.30 in the morning on, on that Friday or whatever it was, May 9th, and the, the guy I bought out texted me. And he says, hey, your license is active. Get your ass in here and start working. <laughs> so. That is awesome. Yeah, and the other thing is, um, <clears throat> you know, there's no good time to buy a practice, start a practice, or have a kid. No. So what you not. want to do is you want to do it when you're young and dumb and have all this energy. But I think um, you know, associating for five, six, seven years, you start getting smarter and slowing down a little, and and you're aware of everything that can go wrong, and it makes it harder to pull the trigger. I mean, I'd rather, you know, when you're young, you know what you know, but you don't know what you don't know, and you mostly don't know. That's the perfect time to start a practice and have a kid. Well, because I'm, if you knew everything about kids, I mean, and and starting a business, I mean, you'd become very risk adverse. My son's going to be one, and I feel like I'm still not ready to be a dad, but I'm still learning everything about that. But um, you know, I, I was really fortunate, um, really blessed. Um, I feel like I, I just I got into a really good situation, and I don't know how much of it was luck or fate or or me doing my research. You know, um, going back to you know your background and everything, how much research you did on your office. It's, it's incredible hearing you talk about it through your podcast, reading your book. Um, so the, what, like I was saying, the, um, one of the franchisors in Ohio was a dentist and an owner at this practice that I, that I own right now. And he did a bunch of research on the area. The, the intersection that we're at, man, it's, it's got to be like 50 or 60,000 cars got to go by it every single day. It's one of the busiest intersections probably in Columbus. Um, he, he knew immediately when, when he opened that area, he was like, this is going to be a gold mine. This is going to be a great office. And so I, I actually had, I met him in dental school because he was doing some recruiting at Ohio State. And um, 
I got to talk to him from about my third year on, and I got to really dive into the practice, really got to dive into research and, and other comfort dentals in the area. Um, I had some friends that I was in a bowling league with in dental school. They actually bought into practices. They graduated a year before me. They bought into their practices. I actually got to see how they were doing and, and really like get it from someone else that's just not trying to sell me a practice. Um, and I did a two week externship actually, cause in, uh, at Ohio state, you're allowed to do two weeks outside of the dental school to see patients and, and get uh, credit for like your fillings and root canals and stuff like that. Um, so I spent two weeks in their office actually doing dental work and, and seeing how they run the business. I went out to Colorado to meet, uh, all the original franchisors and the original, I, I met uh, Dr. Kushner and, and Dr. Norton and all them that, that started it back in the 70s. Um, and, and I really learned a lot about this and, and it just seemed like what I, what I wanted to do. I, I actually really enjoyed seeing, you know, like the, you know, I'll use like the, my paraphrase here, like the, the Medicaid patients, you know, the I don't want to stereotype them, they're people, you know, but like I, we saw that's the same exact population you see in, in dental school. You see people that, you know, have a toothache, have an infection in their mouth, need a root canal as soon as, you know, the, these teeth are waking them up at night. They're in so much pain. They're, they're coming in in tears. Um, these full mouth extractions. I, I enjoy seeing that stuff. I'm, I don't really enjoy doing cosmetic dentistry. You know, I, I was, a uh, at the townie meeting, I, I listened to Dr. John Nosti's lecture. Great guy, awesome dentist. I, I couldn't believe the work that he does. It's just not for me. I, I would much rather do a full mouth extraction. I'd much rather do a, a molar endo or a, you know, a, make a set of dentures for a patient, get their smile back. Um, I mean, I, I, do, I do crown and bridge work. I, I do my share of fixed, but it, I just really enjoy the bread and butter dentistry, just like and I, and I think that's really where the profit margin and, and going back to lowering your overhead, I think if you do more bread and butter dentistry, I think you can, you can see your, your overhead go down or your collections go up or both, you know, and it, it, I think that's what really where the key is. And I think general dentists nowadays, they just want to do those, those cases that the, those $40,000 cases or those $20,000 cases. And if, if that patient is on your schedule and they don't show up or they don't want to do as much as, as much as you treatment planned, well, then your whole day is ruined. Your poss possibly your whole week could be ruined. You know, we're so lucky to have the patient inflow that we have being in this, this huge, super busy area that if someone cancels on our schedule, we have a new patient come in that day and we just say, hey, you have a you've got an abscess on, on this tooth up here. I was like, you, you told me it, it's been causing pain for two days. You haven't slept in like a day. Do you, you just want me to do it now for you? I have a cancellation. I've got an opening. You want me to do it now for you? Your insurance covers it. And they're like, yeah, let's, let's get it done. I want to sleep. <laughs> so that, that's the kind of dentistry I, I enjoy. And I feel like that is kind of getting lost in, in today's you know, generation. Uh, you know, younger dentists just kind of want... They don't want to deal with that kind of dentistry. Well, you know, the, um, it, it's like all the media talks about is all on four. Right. They never talk about all on none. And the all on none m market is 10 times bigger than the all on four. And um, my gosh. Um, um, and then when you, whenever you meet an oral surgeon who doesn't do implants, their overhead's like 35 to 40%. And then when they, then when the ones that are doing implants, it's more like sixty percent. A lot of that really high end dentistry has a lot of cost to it. It does from the flow, the, all the steps, taking all the pictures, all the stuff. I had a lot of those really high end um, guys got severe overhead problems. So bre bread and butter is faster, easier, quicker. Right, and and you know what? Just and and that's another common misconception I feel in, in dentistry nowadays is if you're doing something faster, better like that where you, it's like oh well this guy sees a lot more patients he's doing a lot more work it's it can't be as high of quality you know ask any private practice dentist like how long it takes them to do a molar endo and they'll they'll brag to you all day long and they'll be like oh it takes me 30 minutes that's it 30 minutes for molar endo hey ryan yes. 
Can you find me um, Regina Hertzlinger? She had a quote. Um, I think she called it the focused factory. Doctors who go faster have um, lower um, failure rates, and a lot of people like like I think she did oh, it. I, I think that. she did it with uh, or gallbladder removals. Was, but um, but it, it's it's so obvious if you're a dentist because I mean, uh, an oral surgeon take those four wisdom teeth out, you know fast a general dentist takes that whole appointment to pull out one right so i mean an endodontist does a molar faster than a general so everything you see i mean i've, I've stood behind pediatric dentists who can put eight chrome steel crowns you know just just i mean it's just amazing so yeah so the the faster um you go is the higher quality but a lot of general dentists you know um they'll see that you know they well i need an hour and a half for a crowd then they'll hear some guy across the street scheduling 30 minutes so they they think was well, he a hack well no the guy doing an hour and a half um the assistant seats him he'll go numb then he'll go back and serve facebook for 15 minutes and then reuse gloves now he's got new gloves on then he'll prep then he'll leave and the assistant will pack the cord and i mean and then and then <laughs> you know the assistant takes 30 minutes to do a temporary the guy across the street will numb s set a timer for four minutes write the lab script, take the shade, at four minutes pack the zero cord and the one cord first so the gums are down now so you don't nick them now, you don't have a bleeding problem. Um, do the prep, make the temporary with the assistant, um, and then when he finally goes for an impression, go do a hygiene check and come back, 30 minutes. And I see that guy's prep is better than the guy who's dinking around for 90 minutes. You know, you you are so smart when you, when you say that stuff and, that was one of the key things when I when I first heard you lecture at, at, at Comfort Dental's main office in Colorado. Just you, I feel like you and I share the same kind of mentality for dentistry, and that's you know I, I was kind of a, a late late jumper on, on on your bandwagon and everything. I I didn't really you know in dental school I was like oh yeah Dental Town yeah I heard that that's good you know whatever you know I don't have time for this you know I rather you know be studying or I'd, I'd rather go drink a beer with some friends and everything and uh but you are so right when you say that and and just because th this is the this is one of the key factors in, in lowering your overhead and and producing more is instead of going to numb up a patient and then going back to your office sipping on some coffee looking reading an espn article you know have another patient in another chair so numb up this patient. Say you're doing a crown on number three. This patient gets sat. Oh, hi, how are you doing, Mrs. Jones? Yeah, how, how are you doing from last time? Oh, good, great. Well, uh, today we're gonna do the same exact thing except it's on the other side. So we're gonna get you nice and numb. So say she has like four fillings that she needs to do, like a upper left quad. We're gonna place some topicals, some numbing jelly. We'll, we'll get you nice and numb. So numb that patient up. By the time you numb that patient up, your crown's ready to go. Hop back over to that crown, prep that crown real quick, do the cord or, or traxident, whatever, whatever you prefer. Okay, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, we gotta let this uh, cord and, and uh, putty that we put in here set up for about five minutes here. So sit them up, hang tight, we'll see you in a little bit. Now, now the patient in room two, Mrs. Jones is all numb. She's ready for her fillings. So now you go prep that quad of fillings in five minutes. All right, Mrs. Jones, one of our filling specialists are gonna get those taken care of and filled up for you and um, I'll be back to check on them. So we have EFTAs or EDAs or uh, EFTAs. whatever you guys call them here. In, in Colorado, I know they're called EDAs, um, but it's called an EFTA, so it's Expanded Function Dental Auxiliary. And basically it's an, a dental assistant that has more school and more training. They actually have to be certified. They, they have to be certified dental assistants. They have to have all kinds of credentials and then they can, they can place fillings. So I, I drill the holes and they, they, fill, the, they fill the holes back in. So, so anyway, you just, while, you just while numb and prep. Correct. And then they, they do all the fillings. They do all the fillings. And um, is it mostly amalgam or composite? We mostly do composite, but you know, I, 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 don't, I don't lie to patients. I'm completely honest with them about you know, amalgam fillings, especially some of the patients that we see. I, I see patients that just don't brush their teeth. I see patients that don't take care of themselves whatsoever. 
you know, um, they haven't been to the dentist in five or six years, and they're not coming back after after this visit. Um, and a lot of them don't, you know. So a lot of the times we we have to do same day dentistry on on some of these patients because they won't come back if you schedule them an appointment because they they just don't care. And unless something's hurting, and they you know if it, if it's a back tooth, pull it, and if it's a front tooth, you have to save it, you know. So unless something's hurting, so if nothing's hurting them, you got to convince them almost to to do this dentistry the same day. And that's a great, that's another, um, you know, same, the same day dentistry. Your article uh, just this past month in, in Dental Town, the same day dentistry, genius. Like, no brainer. It, if something's not hurting somebody and, and you're trying to convince them, oh, you, you have uh, three uh, cavities right in between your teeth, you see these little tiny gray specks here on, on the x-ray, you know, I call them flossing cavities, maybe not from flossing as much as you should be, because no one flosses. Um, you're, you're trying to sell somebody these small fillings that, you know, you're going to charge them probably 150 to $200 out of their pocket for uh, a piece. I don't, I don't know the going rate. I, I'm, I just see Medicaid and the the, the Delta and MetLife and Aetna fees are all based off of our, our lower cost UCR fees. So I don't know how much a normal dentist charges, but um, is that is that in the ballpark? Yeah. For a filling. Yeah. Um, especially a composite one because dental insurances pay half as much on amalgam. So you sure you're not getting an amalgam filling because you're not gonna you're not gonna get half half the price. So you're only doing composite. Um, and then you're trying to sell them this stuff that well my teeth don't hurt why should I why should I get this done I'll just wait till it hurts or why why should I spend this four hundred dollars out of my pocket to get these three fillings done and then you know you're and, and then my brings me to another point that we can talk about in a little bit you know you're open from nine to two <clears throat> four days a week or nine to five or eight to five or eight to four you know you're open bankers hours Monday through Thursday so. Now Mrs. Jones has to call off of work and not make any money that day, or she has to take a personal day or a vacation day to come see you, pay $400 to get her treatment done that you know, wasn't hurting her at all, that she doesn't even know if she needs or not. So it's kind of like a double whammy where like she's losing income from not working or taking a vacation day or sick day, and then she has to also pay out of pocket this money because... You know, den dentistry, I feel, is really going the way of more of a convenience and a customer service aspect than it is a, a health aspect. And the, what I mean by that is, you know, people aren't, aren't calling off of work anymore to go see the dentist. Employers are not letting you take time off to go to the dentist. So these dentists that offer evening hours or weekend hours, you know, it's, it's just more convenient for the patient. And, you know, Friday nights are our busiest time in our office. You won't believe how many people come into our office Friday night at 5 p.m. Any dentist that's, that's complaining about new patients and, and how they're not getting enough new patients, open your doors on Friday nights once a month. And man, we, it's like a flood. We can't, we can't keep up with it. We have to like turn patients away and say, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we, we have to reschedule an appointment. We, we are packed. So. You know that that's another point I wanted to to talk about as well. Uh, What's the busiest day of the week at your office? Friday night. Friday, and what'd be the second busiest? Uh, well, Saturdays are super busy too. Saturday mornings. But see, they all have these self-limiting beliefs. They all want to believe that no one shows up on a Friday night. No one shows up on a Saturday. So the whole industry. Uh, but every time I go to a dental office, it's open. Uh, Saturday, they always say it's the busiest day of the week. And you know, a nice day in the summer, yeah, we may not be very busy uh, on a Saturday. There, there are Saturdays where we're dead because the weather's nice outside. Because, and, because and, and that's rare. Because that's rare in <laughs> you know, Columbus, but like Ohio. Right, right. The weather's not as nice. So if if it's a nice sunny day, people are not going to come in. But you know, if it's which if is it's a normal, if it's a normal day, like just normal Columbus weather. People, people are coming in, I mean, it, it, and then uh, we have patients. Uh, we we re we've really tried to cut back on wait time for patients as well, expanding our office. Um, 
because patients were waiting a long time before, like a half hour, 45 minutes. So by, by expanding our office, we've actually cut that wait time almost down to nothing. Maybe like maybe five minutes or so that you're in the waiting room. Otherwise, you, you get in the chair right away. Sometimes on a Saturday, we'll have all 16 chairs full. We'll have three dentists for the 16 chairs. And all the chairs are full, and we have patients that are checked in and waiting to get into one of those chairs and I'll have to apologize to them. It'll be like a Saturday at like 10 a.m., 11 a.m. and they'll be like, why is it taking so long to get back? And I'm like, well, have you ever tried to go to the bank at this hour on a Saturday? You're gonna be waiting in a pretty long line too. It's, just, it's the same thing. Everyone's up now, everyone wants their appointment. You know, it's like come in first thing at 7.30 and you'll get in, you'll get in right away. You know, it's funny when you said uh, on a nice day, on a nice warm weather day and uh Columbus, they might not show up, but when you visit Scandinavia, I mean, they, I mean, they're like almost total darkness for several months, and um, so they, it's got this very small window when it's the best time uh, for you to go there. But then when you go there, the whole country's on vacation and they're gone. So, you, so you go to the, you go there the nicest time of the year, weather-wise, and I mean. The hotels that are, everybody's apologizing, you know, uh, um, hey, you know, half my coworkers, you know, they're laying out in the park, they're sunbathing. So the service is absolutely the worst on those few warm months. Uh, hey, you, a couple things. Um, so dentists are all freaked out about these dental therapists. Right. But when I go to those states where they have dental therapists, the dentists, they're like you, they love them. They're like, God, I'm not, I'm, you know, why? You, you like your after, you like numbing and prepping and then they fill it. Um, why do you think dentists are so uh, concerned about dental therapists? I don't know if you're discussing like a mid-level provider. Yeah. So that, that's, that's totally different than, than an FDA right, or an Right, because F. they can numb and drill. Correct. They, they, can so do, you, they can do irreversible procedures. But wouldn't you? The would you cannot. But would you switch out your FDAs for dental therapists if the girls could see them, numb them, prep them, fill them? I wouldn't see why not. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't, I'm indifferent on it, you know. Because um, I'm very, I, that was. What's your um, opinion on it? What's well, your honest was, opinion on that it? That was the deal break, almost the deal break. I almost stayed in Kansas just for EFTAs. And I've been in Arizona Do they 30 have, years. They don't have them in Arizona, right? They just passed it last year. Okay. But now, um, you know, you got to train them. So they, they put out a... Um, right. So now they, they're they working with the local dental schools. And I think Phoenix College um, is going to start a program. But uh, my gosh, it's so jealous when you're in Kansas and you see a dentist. Num, 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 num. Four rooms. Prep, 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 prep. And then he goes and sits on the computer for half an hour. And, and they have the time. Um, yeah, I... Well, see, I don't even do that. I don't. I don't take any breaks. I yeah. don't take lunches. I, I'd rather see more patients because more patients means more production, which means less overhead, which means sure. higher higher revenues. Oh yeah, it's uh, and, and any and any dentist that is afraid to talk about the business aspect, like you own a business, and you know the first thing is not making money. It's taking care, taking as best care of your patients as possible. So just just to clarify that, but. To, you know, all these dentists that are afraid to, to call themselves like a business owner or a salesman, you know, you have to accept that in the field of dentistry. You have, when you sell, when you talk to somebody, when you talk to Mrs. Jones and say that there's three small DO fillings on her teeth and you're trying to get her convinced to spend $400 on something that doesn't hurt her at all, um, you know that is selling. You you are selling some something to somebody. I, know, I don't know why they're not proud to sell it. Um, hey, you mentioned Traxident. You like that more than Cord? No, I I, I actually like Cord better. Uh, what I'll do is I'll um, I'll use non Epi Cord, so just like plain Cord, and then I'll dip it in Hemadent. I've never tried Cord with like epinephrine in it, but I think cost wise, it's just it's just less cost to to uh, do the cord and dip it in a little bit of hemodent than it is to actually buy the cord with the epi in it. So um, that's just like a cost thing. But um, I do like packing cord better and I've gotten a lot faster at it since dental school. You know, it used to, you know, when it used to take me 45 minutes to pack a cord, you know, it takes me just like maybe two minutes, three minutes to pack a cord if it's like really tough gums and they're really fighting back at me. But um, sometimes I'll do cord and Traxident at the same, you know, for the same thing, just to make sure that everything is completely hemostatic and the blood stopped and and the gums are as 
much out of the way as possible. Depending on the situation, sometimes I just use Traxodent, but I like it. It's it's a great product. I, and I actually just listened to that uh, entire podcast, uh, the CEO of Premier that you just had recently. So, what, what about the hygiene department? Uh, so we we just started doing uh, we just started having hygienists a few years a couple years ago. Um, we just got too busy to the point where we couldn't do our own cleanings um, and and do them do them well enough for the patients. So we had to bring in hygienists. I still do some of my own cleanings if we're super busy and the hygienists are are busy doing their thing. I'll I'll still go into a room and I'll do my own cleaning. I have no shame in that. I know a lot of dentists. I actually know a pretty pretty well known dentist in Ohio. I, won't say his name or anything, but he kind of uh, thinks it's a uh, you're like it's like condescending to do a cleaning as a dentist, and I I never got that, but um, maybe because maybe just because I've done cleanings my whole career from dental school, and then I just started when I got out, so may, maybe I never had that opportunity to like hate clean doing cleanings, you know, or or think I'm above think I'm above doing a cleaning, and I'm not saying that's everybody, but it just. I, I've actually heard from people that have associated with this dentist that they were like, you're, you're not doing your, your own cleanings, you're above that. Yeah, you know, and these dentists, they don't even, um, they'll have, they'll have uh, their appointment will fall apart and they'll have an opening. They'd rather sit back in their office for an hour surfing the internet then do a cleaning, and someone would be on the phone and say, when's your next opening? Oh, I can't get you in a day. And it's like, what do you mean you can't get in a day? The, the dentist opened right there an hour. And they're like, uh, oh, he won't do cleanings. And then the next thing out of the dentist's mouth is, why is overhead so high? And then the then same, same day dentistry, you know, you go in there and they, they got a cavity. Well, let's do it right now. Same day. Let's do it right now. Especially they go, well, I got another patient in 10 minutes or in 15 minutes. Like, have an extra chair, jump two rooms. Especially if it's a maxillary tooth. Like, if it's, like, number three and it's, like, an OL or if it's number five and it's a DO, it's like, come on, man. That's going to take two seconds to do. And you, you can't, you're going to have to, this person's already here for an hour cleaning, which is unnecessary for, for it to be that long for an, for an appointment. You're going to make them come back for another hour appointment, take time out of their day to do one, two surface filling that is not going to take very long. Right. They're already in your chair. They're already motivated. You know, just, you know, I, I do They it don't want to come back. They don't want to come back. Uh, I'm sorry. You know, you may and think that your patients And the dentist doesn't you. track his close rate, so he doesn't even know what his close rate is. You're a better dentist if you have a higher close rate. Right. I mean, I mean because the dentistry that you never do... Is just bacterial infection. So if you're not removing the, the cavity, then you're not a very good dentist. I mean, so many dentists want to talk about what they fill the hole with. You know, it's like let let let's focus on getting the caries out of there more. Correct. And and same day and uh, yeah. And uh, but this is but this is one thing that Rick Kirshner has been saying for thirty years is so true, and that is he never wanted associates because when you got skin in the game. When you bought a partnership, that it attracts the people that hustle, and these um, these DSOs, um, none of them are publicly traded in the United States because it's that it's that dilemma. Like when you go uh, lecture, when you go to any dental lecture, the associates um, are on their Facebook whole time, but the owner is paying attention. The owner is hustling because he has the debt. Um, the owner is going to try that molar root canal. The associate, oh, I'll send it to an endodontist. The owner will try to remove that tooth. Oh, I need to send. So it's that associate dilemma that the people, it's a, um, the people who don't want to have skin in the game, they're not like you. They're not hustling. They're not, they're not, you know, eating their lunch, uh, you know, standing up. They're, uh, so you get someone who, um, slower. Doesn't want to hustle. Dele all they do is feed specialists. You are so right. And then, and, and Rick Kirshner has been saying for thirty years he he doesn't have any associates because I I've actually I've actually kind of tried to switch my mentality occasionally, where um, if I'm a salary dentist, oh absolutely I'm not I'm not going to do same day dentistry. I'm on a salary. I don't. I don't really care, or or maybe I'm on like thirty percent collection. Uh, I don't really, you know, I don't really feel like working that hard today. You know, I, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. I was out last night, you know, with my friends. You know, being an owner and having this debt and owning a business and making sure that it's successful for my wife and my my child now, my newborn. 
it's everything. And it is like the motivating factor and like the driving factor. And you're absolutely right. If you don't have skin in the game, you are not going to be as motivated to, to make sure that that business just runs on all four, six, or eight cylinders, however many cylinders you have. And, it, and it's like anything else in life. It, this applies to just life in general. If you're given a car and, and with no responsibility, no payments on it, uh, you're not going to take care of it. You know, my, my very first car, I was given, it was like an 86 Toyota Corolla. Um, it was given to me by my grandmother. I didn't take care of it, and I, I wrecked it. And I learned a big lesson from that. I, I was very stupid, and I, I, I got into a car accident like three months after I got my license when I was 16. And I didn't have a car for like five or six months. And that next car... I had my mom bought it. It was a '93 Toyota Tercel. My mom paid for it at the at the car dealership, but she made me pay like three thousand dollars over six to nine months, however long it took me to pay it. I had to make payments. I paid that car in, in full, and you know I was only like eighteen at the time, so three thousand dollars. I'm like, gee, that's a lot of money, you know. Um, and so it, it it applies to anything in life. If you were just given something. You will not take care of it. No matter what you say you will, you will not take care of it. If you buy something and it's your own money, your own blood, sweat, and tears into it, you are going to make sure that that thing is going as, as long and as well as, as you can. Yeah, there's a... Um, I mean, the jury's really... I, I think the jury is still out on just the entire associates, uh, the associates period. I mean, it, when, when people... Or running chains with just associates, they, they don't appear to be in the profit zone. Um, I, I and I've heard accounting numbers that are f frightening, um, just because it's that it's that bias selection. You know what I mean? I'm not going to take CE. I'm not going to try to do molar endo. I'm not going to hustle. Um, and that that by, that reminds me by you talking about the molar endo thing, like not doing molar endo. A couple key quotes that that you said that everyone should hear. You know that maybe has not. Listen, listen to a couple podcasts or, or read, a, read your book, you know, like three phrases that you have said just like stick in my mind every single day when I'm working on patients. One of them um, you said at the Comfort Dental uh, uh, main office, you said, you know, until you get your student loans paid off, you better treat every single kid that comes into your office and you better learn how to take out wisdom teeth. And I I think that is just such phenomenal uh, advice to give new dentists that are coming out of dental school and new dentists that are in practice. And then the, the, another one that stuck out to me too, you know, you say like, you know, the only difference between you and an endodontist is they did 50, 50 molar endos while they were in school before they graduated. So just start your 50 molar endos now in your practice and you'll be just as good as, a, as an endodontist. You know, you don't have to see the ones that have like six roots on them. You don't have to see the ones that are severely dilacerated, but a, a typical molar endo is not hard. You know, my, my first couple, yeah, I, I screwed them up, but that, you know, everyone says, well, that's why they call it a dental practice, you know, because you, <laughs> Until you get better at them, until you become an expert at them, yeah, you are going to mess up a little bit, but you can't let that fear of, of failing stop you. If you want to be successful in any business at all, failure is just a normal part of the routine, and it just makes you stronger. It makes you work that much harder, and that mentality, unfortunately, is getting lost in, in some of the millennial generation. Yeah, um, but again, with the millennials... Um the ones that have skin in the game. I mean, you know, if they, if they, um, I, I find it interesting on student loan debt. Um, if you only owe like under twenty thousand dollars student loans, that's the majority of the default. Um, once you're over a hundred thousand dollars in student loans, let alone two, three, four hundred, the default rate's almost zilch, because it's that human psychology. At at a hundred thousand dollars, you're committed. At 200, 300, 400, you're, you're damn committed. But these guys dinking around a couple of years, $20,000, they, they never even were committed. And um, I, so many of these young dentists come out of school and they, they've already committed to borrowing three, four hundred thousand dollars of other people's money. And then they sit there and say, well, I don't like Molarindo. Well, at this point, I don't care if you like it. Right. And you don't like working on children. Well, at, the, at this point, we're, we're past that. 
You're five hundred thousand dollars in the hole, dude, and that kid <laughs> screaming needs a pole potty and a crumb still crown. You know, yeah. just yeah, I absolutely agree. You know, like and that that's what keeps me going at five thirty at night when I'm working a twelve hour day and someone comes into my office crying in pain, they haven't slept in a couple days, and they need a molar endo done, and I I'm just like, you know what? I gotta do this. I gotta. I gotta get this molar endo done. You know, it's, it, I'll, I'll be happy about it when it's over. I'm, I'm not looking forward to doing this molar endo right now. But let's set it up. Let's get you numb. Let's get you out of pain. And once it's over and I'm done with it, I will be thankful that I did it because that's extra revenue that I brought into my my practice. Plus, I got I got this patient out of pain. I know that they're gonna be able to go to sleep tonight, knowing that, you know, their their tooth is fixed and everything. Yeah, I, I like that practice. Too. I, I think that's the most fun in a dental office is the emergency room. I mean, you know. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I, I, I actually need to go to emergency rooms around our office because we so many patients go to ERs first for dental pain. And you, you know more about this than I do, the, the toll on like health insurance and the economy that how much money is probably wasted on emergency room visits it's, for it, it's It's the reasons. most embarrassing part of uh, the sovereign profession of dentistry is that 8% of the country's emergency room visits are odontogenic in origin. And that's simply because we're not doing our job. Exactly. And then when they go there, not only is it like a $1,500 charge minimum, they're not doing anything. They're just giving them opioids, antibiotics. Um, it's but, but it's kind of weird in the hospital because... Um, Man, if you can remove a brain tumor, fix a broken leg, if, I mean, I can't imagine 8% of people going to Walmart asking for something at Walmart saying, no, we, we don't carry that because eight out of every hundred people ask for it. I mean, these hospitals, I, I can't believe they just don't start having a dental division. I mean, right. they got a maternity ward, they can deliver a baby. If eight out of a hundred of your customers need a dentist, I'm surprised they don't do it. Well, and, it, and if you could take out a brain tumor or you can operate on a heart, you could take a tooth out. It's not, it's, not, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. Taking a tooth out is fairly easy compared to doing something like that. Yeah, and... and We're it, not real it's, doctors. It's because, it's because people <laughs> uh, don't realize how much um, tradition hangs over. Like, I always thought it was bizarre that the Italians, they'll deliver pizza to your front door, um, but um, the Mexicans don't deliver and it wasn't until Uber Eats, I mean, I, I, every time I go in there, I say, how come you guys don't do delivery? And they would even say, oh, that's, the Chinese do that, the Italians do that, and they just laugh. It's like, well, dude, the, you know, the, um, I know the lady owns Panda Garden. It's like two-thirds of her business is delivery. Yeah. I mean, so, so you know, why, why, do, uh, why do people just do these traditional things, you know? I, I don't know, and, and maybe, uh, maybe I'm not normal and out of the ordinary, but uh, I, I just ch I choose to to see more patients and I choose to work harder than I need to, um, because it's well. First of all, it's good for the business, and second of all, it's it's the right thing to do. If I turned away all these patients, you know, I have I have friends that that work in private practice offices that they're either associates or they've. Some of my friends have started buying into offices now four, four years out of dental school. They've, they've started opening up their offices. And they'll brag about how they're booked solid for three or four weeks. And, and oh, I'm booked solid three or four weeks out. I'm, I'm not taking appointments until two months from now. It's like, man, I, I'm upset if I can't get somebody in tomorrow. Like, I'm, I'm upset if my schedule is full tomorrow, you know, or, or all... I want to get that person in as soon as possible because if you are scheduling someone out for a month for, for a crown that, that they don't even you know, think they need and they're going to maybe go get a second opinion because you know, like, this tooth isn't bothering me, you know, I, I get my cleanings every six months, you keep telling me I need this crown, you know, maybe I just should go get a second opinion. You, if you give them a month to, to think about that, they're not going to come back or they're just going to keep pushing off, pushing it off. And then, the, and then the tooth breaks, and, and then you have to take it it's out. It's funny how they always say, well, how do you get rid of cancellations and no-shows? Uh, you ought to just give them what they asked for. And they, when, when, when did this person make the appointment? Two weeks ago. Did they ask to be scheduled two weeks out? Oh, no. Well, you know, he wanted to come in. He wanted to come in that day or the next day. And it's like, oh, so you're asking me, you didn't give the patient, the customer, what it wanted, and then you're shocked they didn't come in and get what they didn't want.
Not, and, I mean, you know, crazy. Dentistry is definitely going in the route of customer service. And, and that, that was, you know, what I was touching on earlier. Uh, it is, a, is going to a customer service orientation field um, more, than, more than a healthcare field. We, we are becoming like a, just like a, a, a convenience, a service provided for, for people. And, it, and if you can't give them what they want, I, I hate going to the doctor and... It's like, can I just can I just come in for a checkup and and uh, my my like yearly physical and everything? And they go, oh, we can see you in about three weeks. It's like I hate that. So why would I why would I do that to my patients in my office? Um, you know, I I want to be seen. You know, I'm motivated. If I'm calling your office to schedule a checkup, I am motivated. You know, right now or tomorrow or my next day off, whatever is convenient for me. Like in sometime in the near future, if I can't be seen for three weeks. I'm not, I'm going to be, I'm going to lose interest. You know, I'm a healthy guy for the most part. I feel I don't need a checkup. I'm probably good. So if I'm, if I don't want to do it, I'll, I'll push it off till some other time. And, that, and that, that's a lot of the dentistry that's being, being done where it's, you know, the patient is not in any pain. Uh, they don't, in their mind, you're selling the invisible, like you, like you, the quote from you, selling the invisible, like they, they don't know they have it. They can't tell. It's not hurting them. It's not bothering them. But you're telling them that they need it done, and but they can't see it. You can't get it done for three or four weeks. Yeah. That was the fastest hour ever, Ryan. I cannot believe that. We went over an hour. Um, you say I, that with everybody. Really? <laughs> I mean, it just seems like that. It, it was it like, was very fast. I, like I, I, could, I could talk to you for hours on end. I, I, I feel like we... Just I, I, I think you have a very similar mindset to me with your hard work and you know, going back to when you started your office, you worked what, sixty hours a week oh, somewhere, yeah. you worked twelve hour days Monday through Friday or Monday yeah. through Saturday yeah. to get your business going. You, you seem like you're from a very like blue collar mentality oh, too. Yeah. And I just think that's missing in, in the dental field nowadays. Even if you just do one extra procedure a day. Say for example, you take a tooth out or you do one filling. Say it's a hundred bucks extra a day. I did the calculations on the plane this morning on a on an airplane napkin. Uh, you know, you do a hundred dollars extra a day in production. That's four hundred dollars a week if you work four days. That's sixteen hundred dollars for four weeks or for a month. Let's say what well, there's fifty two weeks in a year, right? Let's say you work only 48 weeks. Say you take two two-week vacations throughout the year. Okay, so that's 48 weeks times $400. That's $20,000 almost of extra production for that year. Let's say you have a million-dollar practice that you, that you uh, produce $1 million. And say you have a 65% overhead. You've, you've just decreased by doing that extra procedure every single day. You just decreased your overhead by about a, a percentage and a half. And it's just incredible. That's just extra money that you can either pocket yourself or you can reinvest into the business or you can, that could be your, that could be your end of the year bonus to your staff that you just, you buy your Christmas presents with and everything. Or that could be your money for the next year that you spread out throughout the year and, and give as bonuses when you feel it's needed. Or, or that's your lunch money when you, you know, a couple times a month you decide to buy the staff lunch and everything like that. Just, just from doing one procedure a day, and that, that's $100. Your procedure is probably more expensive than $100. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me why a lot of dentists don't want to do same-day dentistry or don't want to work just a tiny bit harder to to increase their revenue and increase their production and, and better their business. The, the specialist, um, not only do they make almost double on average what a general dentist does, it's like 333 is the average specialist and 174 is the average general dentist, but one thing the oral surgeons and the periodontists and the endodontists, they all do is they all have extra operatories and they work people in that day. A lot of it's biased because I'm afraid if I can't get, you call me up and you want me to see your patient and they're very paranoid if they say, well, I can't get them in today or tomorrow. Well, you might call another in and on us and they might lose the whole annuity of that referring account. So a lot of it's paranoia, but my gosh, I'm squeezing in 
toothaches, you know, for endodontists, oral surgeons. I mean, they uh, periodontists, periodontal abscesses. That's the big secret. Those guys work hard. You have to get good enough at your profession where you can do fillings, root canals, and extractions just so efficiently and so quickly that you can see patient, more patients and you can squeeze in something. I'm not saying you have to do a whole bunch, just, just one or maybe two more patients a day. It is going to just do wonders for your production and wonders for your, for your overall business. And the and, other thing about working in uh, someone during lunch is that your one o'clock might not show up. Right. So now you had an hour lunch, your one o'clock to the show, so two hours of no productivity. I, I just don't know why. Uh, it's just life's so much easier when you work hard. I can't stand sitting in my office. I cannot stand it. I, I despise being in my office. I want to be working on patients, and I want to be treating as many people as I can because it... It just, it makes the day go by so much final, faster. Final thought, since I raised four boys, and your Alexander is, how old is he? Coming <laughs> He's going to be one, one in June. And one in June. My only advice on little Alexander is when we do endo, we read um, endo books. Um, you know, we, you know, our whole academy, and um, what I do is I'd find a really good author search, because so many books on child rearing are just uh, made by uh, just motivated parents, but Find yourself a really good PhD um, book on raising children. That was one of the smartest moves I ever did. And, and uh, I was at Barnes & Noble looking for some other book, a business book, and I saw this and it said, uh, Raising Boys. Now, this was 20 years ago, uh, but um, I thought, you know, the nuns I always teach to do the author search. I didn't want it to be some holly jolly mom that's all, you know, that's fluff. I wanted the real stuff. And I read that one PhD book. And then she re uh, referenced other books. But I, I, I think I put away about uh, three books uh, by PhDs on raising boys. So it turned out they all were boys. But I, I look back, that was so damn, I'm so glad I did that. It, yeah, it seems like you Cause, you've cause done a good a job child, raising them too. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to do everything trial by error, and you don't want to... Um, you don't want to learn lessons the hard way, but one solid PhD book on how to raise a baby boy. Well, I'm currently reading, um, uh, I think it's called Caring for Your Child, Birth to Age 5 by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Nice. So you're and already so, on it. Good for you. I, I'm trying to read, like, like you said, I, another quote of yours that's sticking in my brain, leaders are readers. And I, I hate reading, but I make myself do it because you just learn so much more from, from reading. I, I don't get these ideas. I'm not smart. I'm not like above average, okay? I was like middle of my pack, maybe even below average in my class. Like I'm not the smartest person around. I just take things, I, you know, I, I see a business model, you know, I, and that, that's what led me to Comfort Dental, you know, I, it's like these guys seem to have it, have it figured out. And then I just take pieces of information that I, that I collect from other people and I, I try to say, how can I incorporate this into my own thing? You know, it, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm, I'm trying to use your pe best advice of how to use a wheel, his best advice of how to use, her best advice, her experience, and, it, and I try to create that to make the best possible experience for me. And I'm, I'm not a smart guy. I just, I just try to take advice from other people and I try to learn as much as I can. And, and uh, You're I, a I very hate, smart guy, doctor. I hate reading, You're just but... humble and you, and you hustle. That, Two that, best ingredients. That's all you humble gotta do. Humble and hustle. What two greater qualities could anyone ever want? And one, on that note, one other thing, yeah. uh, you you interviewed Bob Lang, the the dental student from Ohio State, uh, a couple weeks ago. He's I know you guys are coming to the ODA in September. You guys should let me know when you're coming. I want I want in on that refractory dinner. All right, you guys are going. To. Oh, that's I've, right. I've never, I've never eaten there. Oh and my I, god! I just heard wonders and wonders and things. So that so that'd be a great opportunity. I'll I'll bring my wife. I'll bring the baby. Well, what he's referring to is you know um, a lot of these um, Catholic churches. You know they were sold, um, um, lost membership, what have you. And a, a real estate developer, a restaurant guy, bought a Catholic church and turned it into a restaurant. It is so cool. So if you would have me, I, I would Absolutely. love to. I would love to to join I you guys for dinner. I will see you next in, in Ohio. Thank you so much.